Hello and welcome to Club A. We are a university club dedicated to learning cybersecurity and uh, learning by doing. So we learn how to hack, we practice hacking, and we teach hacking skills. Today's video is about cracking passwords. So we'll learn a little bit about how passwords are stored. We'll learn about the difference between um, encoding, ciphers, encryptions, and hashes. We'll learn a little bit about what plain text is. We'll learn some of the tools that are used in cracking passwords. We'll learn how to crack a password and what that actually means. And then I'll give you a demonstration of how to use online crackers and tools like John the Ripper and Hashcat. So what is plain text? Well, plain text is the original format of your password. So if you type in your password to like a web browser or something like that, how you see it is plain text. If you were to type it into a notepad and save it on the desktop, that's plain text. It means no applic or no encryption is applied to the text, no encodings are applied, nothing. It's just plain text. And we'll get into a little more of that right away. So an encoding, the reason why we're talking about encodings is because some people mix up encodings with encryption, and there's a huge difference between the two. Encodings are simply a way to turn text into a computer-manageable or more computer-manageable format. Uh, an example, some of the examples of uh, encodings would be hexadecimal, as you can see there. These, you know, there's letters and numbers there. Hexadecimal only involves the numbers 0 through 9, and then A through F. It's a, it's a 16, base 16, I think. Um, and then base 64 is another way of encoding text. Decimal is the... It's, it's a number representation of every ASCII character, uh, including special characters and some system functions. And then binary, which is the ones and zeros. It's how the computer sees data. So those are encodings, and they're meant to be more for computers to work better with data. ASCII is more for human, and there's different kinds of human encodings like UTF, dash, whatever, whatever. There's a million kinds out there. Um, UTF-8 is probably the most popular. So encodings are not really a security measure. If you were to use encodings to secure your data, that's security by obscurity, and that's not an effective way to secure your data um, because encodings can easily be decoded, and that's the point. So ciphers. Ciphers are a way of taking a message and turning it into an unrecognizable way, um, an unrecognizable format basically so there's many 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 examples of ciphers out there um, as you can see in the pictures here on the on the left side the first one there with the grids is the pig pen cipher developed by the freemasons they would use it in their masonry and that kind of stuff if you do a lot of escape rooms you'll see pig the pig pen cipher tons like a lot of uh, a lot of different escape rooms will use that um and then there's other kinds of um they're, they're more fictional languages that are just like letter for letter substitutions for English characters. This one is, I think, Klingon from Star Trek. This one is, it's the dragon <laughs> scroll or whatever they call that from Skyrim. And this is the alien language from Futurama. So I included those because some people will encode or cipher their messages using you know, fictional languages, uh, when in reality, all you got to do is just look it up. This can get pretty crazy, though. Some people come up with constructed languages that are really hard to decipher. So ciphers are, are historically archaic, which means that, uh, like, for example, Julius Caesar invented, I think it's a transposition cipher. So it's the ROT 13, where he would trans, he would um, basically, or a shift cipher is another word for it. You would take each letter in the message and, and and substitute it for with another lever, letter 13 characters along in the alphabet. Um, so, for example, if you were to shift the word my pass 13 characters, it would look like that. As you can see, like S would become F. You can see right there, there's two Fs representing two S's, etc., etc. So the Vignir, it's a lot more complicated, but and you you require a key for the Vignir, which adds another layer of complexity to the ciphering but it would spit it out like that. There's Morse, so you can translate this to Morse. Arguably, that's an encoding and not a cipher because uh, it's a way you know, for telegrams, right? That kind of a thing. 
So there's these are the t different types of ciphers, and we're not going to do an entire presentation on that. So substitution, transposition, polygraphic, permutation, look those up, check them out. Uh, take your time. You might really you might not really need them for for hacking, but it's just this type of thing is is nice to know, get you in that like paranoid mindset that hackers have. Um, they can be quite secure if they're used properly. A lot of more complex ciphers like Big Near and uh, I don't know, the rail fence cipher are pretty, pretty good. Uh, one historically complex example would be the Enigma code, which was developed by the Nazis in uh, World War II, which was notoriously difficult to decrypt. And uh, there's an entire movie about decrypting it, which is really cool. Okay, uh, so encryption. Well, what's the difference between encoding ciphers and encryption? Well, encryption involves a mathematical algorithm. It, it's far more complex, and arguably, if the if the algorithm is not prone to weaknesses, it can be very, very reliable and very, very secure. So, as you can see here, this is a kind of an you know an a relationship diagram that shows you what goes on in the encryption and it it's just as complex as it looks i'm not going to explain it i just wanted to show you guys um i think this is for uh <laughs> it's the precursor to uh aes encryption it's the precursor to that so that's what this represents because the more modern ones are even more complex in there they're pretty wild man so what uh an encrypted version of my past would look like with AES is using the key yeetus yeetus yeet and the IV 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This is what it would come out looking like. My past would look like that. Now there's a lot of underlying things going on within this encryption scheme like cipher blockchaining and that type of stuff which is different than blockchaining but uh, there's a reason why they use similar words. Um, and so there's some padding going on because obviously my pass does not come out to this many characters, right? So there's some padding going on to make it very hard to figure out what the original text was. And if you use the key in the IV, it spits out these this many letters. So the only thing really to watch out for encryptions is like don't use outdated algorithms like DES, DES. That one is way outdated. Never use it, right? Use ones like AES or you know, AES-256, like the more modern uh, encryptions. And that goes to say with any of this stuff, look up what the, the latest, you know, usually open source is the best because uh, any open source algorithm is subject to criticism and is being constantly perfected. Uh, and then before we talk about hashes, I need to highlight something really important about the nature of hashes versus encryption. Um, encryption is meant to be two-way, a, a two-way algorithm. So you encrypt the message, it looks like this, and then with the key, you decrypt it on the other side. Um, so it's meant to be two-way. That's what I mean by two-way. Another word for that is ace, no, is symmetrical. So symmetrical encryption means it can be encrypted and decrypted both ways, but a hash is not two ways, right? A hash is a one-way algorithm, meaning that you put in the message or the data, you run it through the hash function and it spits out a hash digest, which is usually some kind of hexadecimal that cannot be converted back. So hopefully you see the logical dilemma here with cracking a hash because passwords are always stored, not always, but they're usually stored as hashes, right? Which is a one-way algorithm. So there's no way to convert this back to its original password unless there's a flaw in the algorithm. But the best hash, hash algorithms out there um, are, you know, don't have these kinds of weaknesses where they can be converted back or they can be cracked. Not cracked, I shouldn't say that, because we are going to crack that, uh, hashes today. So cracking doesn't mean converting it back. You can't re or unhash something or decrypt a hash. You crack a hash. So SHA-1 and MD5 don't use these hashes. They're outdated. They have weaknesses. They're like MD5 is prone to collision, which means that two words can have the same hash technically. It's very rare, but 
you have just the right order of bytes in there, you can have the exact same hash, which is wicked dangerous. Um, so when I say very good, I mean hashing is very good. Not these two, but hashing is very good. So if hash is one way, then how do we crack it? Well, it's all brute force, man. Uh, the only way to crack a hashed password is to basically take a whole bunch of words from a known dictionary is what we call it, or a, wor a word list, and run them through the hashing algorithm and compare the resulting hashes. And if the resulting hash from the word list that you're, you're generating matches with the hash you're trying to crack, then it's a crack. If you've just cracked that hash, you've cracked the code, right? You've figured out what the original password is by running it through, running a whole bunch of words through and matching the, the, the hashes they spit out. So, um, <laughs> so that's one way through dictionaries and then psychotically brute forcing uh, by just guessing like 00001, 00002, and that kind of thing. Like just every single possible combination of letters and numbers and special characters and hopefully getting the right password hash out of it. While they've done the math on that kind of thing, and depending on the complexity of the password, it could take you more time than there is in the universe to crack a significantly complex password. So this is not the best way to do it. Neither is this technically. So most people do a hybrid, which is a mashup of dictionary and brute forcing. And dictionary just be like word lists. And we'll show you word lists in a moment here. So the best dictionary slash word lists are um, like rockyou.txt. It comes with Kali Linux. It's in the directory user share word lists rockyou. You might have to unzip it or untar it or whatever you want to call that. Sec lists is also really good. This is just a rockyou is a company. They were storing passwords for 30 million users in plain text on their database that had a 10 year old SQL flaw. And a hacker broke in, stole the passwords, dumped it on the on the deep web, and then it surfaced and it's everywhere and used for everything now. So it was I think there's 14 million passwords in the original Rocky from 2005. Um, huge, huge, crazy thing. Crack station. Well, well, I'll show you Crack Station in a bit. It's a wonderful place to crack um, hashes. Basically, you use Crack Station for anything you think is a weak or simple password. Anything more than that, it's really hard to crack, and I'll kind of show you guys that in a bit. Uh, I put I, I don't know here because, you know, if you're really going to be cracking passwords, like, good luck. But <laughs> Seclis is pretty good. There's, it's a huge repository of, of uh, generated and pseudo-generated passwords that might look like people's actual passwords. Uh, this is gigabytes and gigabytes of stuff, so just be careful if you're going to download that because it's going to take up space. Uh, but most most uh, wordless out there are not actual password dumps. Rocky was one of the best password dumps we've ever seen. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a new one that they call Rocky 2021. Well, that's not like the new and best version of Rocky. It's just a, a word list that's been like, uh, they, I mean, they call it like a smart list because it was they took a whole bunch of like, uh, it's hard to explain this. So they took like the rock you password list and then they ran it through a whole bunch of rule sets where it generated and regenerated a whole bunch of those passwords with like leet speak and stuff like that and adding characters to the end and the middle and the, the beginning and that type of stuff. And uh, they also added a whole bunch of like, additional passwords to it but it's mostly just generated stuff they added the entire dictionary to it like yeah, i don't know you can use it it might be good but you'll be sitting there trying to crack a password for like six weeks so what tools do you use for password cracking john the ripper super good hydra that's for uh, online password cracking so if you're trying to crack the password of like a ssh server it's more for password brute forcing or if you're performing like a password spray or uh, cred credential stuffing attack, you'd be using something like Hydra. Uh, Hashcat, that's for cracking. So these two, these three actually are offline password cracking tools, meaning that you've extracted the hash and now you're just spending time cracking them. So one thing about, uh, this is uh, off crack or OPH crack. I don't know how to say it. Actually, I've never said it out loud. <laughs> off crack is, uh, it's, it's a rainbow table password cracking thing so basically it, it takes 
a whole bunch of pre-computed hashes and just compares the hash you've given it with those hashes. So it, it skips a step, basically. So you need to download all these repos of um, already generated password hashes that include default pass passwords and that kind of stuff. So I don't know. It's a different, it's a different approach to password cracking. Hashcat and uh, John the Ripper operate pretty similar uh, to each other, not to offcrack. They don't use rainbow tables, I don't think. But uh, anyways, so additional information. So I'm going to be showing you password cracking in a virtual machine. Um, password cracking in a virtual machine does not utilize your system's full potential or hardware. It uses the, the processing space that is given to the virtual machine, meaning that it's not going to use your graphics card. It's not going to use even the full potential of your CPU. It's only going to be using like a fraction of your computing power. So it's not going to be that great unless you have, you know, really good hardware. Uh, if you really want to like crank up your password cracking potential, you got to do it on the host OS. So if you're running Windows, you're not really going to be able to run John the Ripper. You you can probably run uh, Hashcat on there. I've done that before, and it 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 is mu it's significantly better than running it in a VM. Um, but ultimately, like yeah, you got to migrate to the host OS if you want to do any like real and significant password cracking. So some of the best resources out there for ciphers and decoding ciphers is decode.fr. Uh, it's a French website, so that's why the E ends at the end. Um, online password cracking websites would be like crackstation, hashes.com. Uh, I mean, you can pay to get your, your hashes cracked, but don't do that, man. Like, I do not recommend that. So I advise just figure out how to crack it yourself and do it that way. 